is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Radical restructuring Credit Suisse shares tumble on plans to raise $4 billion of capital to fund a sweeping overhaul. We'll bring you more of our interview with the chief executive. Moment of truth, the ECB is set to double its benchmark rate to highest in over a decade, ramping up the fight against inflation. We're live in Frankfurt. Plus, back to reality, Meta sinks 20% in extended trading as sales disappoint. Skyrocketing VR costs spook investors. Well, good morning, everyone. This is what the markets are looking at. Again, there's a bit of a wobble overall because the market is focusing not only on the earnings that disappointed, including uh, tech, but they're also looking ahead to the ECB, thinking what can they do? What does it mean for TLTRO? And do we have a timeline on QT for next year? We, by the way, have a great chart on the Hawks versus Doves on the ECB Governing Council meeting and how much uh, their opinion also weighs in. Technology shares are down 1.7%. We had a great roundup from our Matt Bloxham on why Meta did so poorly and the fact that they need to find revenue streams elsewhere if they're going to continue spending so much on virtual reality. Banks uh, gaining 1% or one-tenth of a percent, but when you look at Credit Suisse, it's really getting slammed for a number of reasons. And then U.S. dollar, 1,318. We chose a Bloomberg U.S. dollar to show you. We could have also chosen a pair. European map, but this is a picture, and I find it quite interesting that over the last five trading sessions, the FTSE has actually not been trading in tandem with the rest of Europe. So maybe this is a bit of investors that have been left on the sideline because of the UK political situation uh, today coming back in when the CAC 40, for example, is down some six tenths of 8%. So Credit Suisse tumbling after announcing plans to raise $4 billion to fund a sweeping overhaul. The bank also announced thousands of job cuts after reporting a fourth straight loss. Well, I spoke to the Credit Suisse chief executive, Ulrich Kerner, and asked him what was the driving force behind the company's plan. Today, the bank has parts which are not profitable enough, as we all know, from the shareholder perspective. And that's why we came up with, you know, the, the need of taking very decisive actions in mainly three different areas. The one is uh, radical restructuring of the investment bank. The second one is significant reducing costs going forward, as you have seen. And the third one, very importantly, further strengthening of our capital basis. Why is that? Because we want to go through the transformation of the next three years with a very, very strong capital base and leave the transformation also with a very strong capital base. So, so these are, you, are the three things. Are, are you confident that the announcement today actually puts the capital question to bed? Yes. A hundred percent. What kind of uh, conversations have you had with shareholders? No, we have permanent conversations with shareholders. I think they fully understand, you know, our package, what we are doing in the area of capital, because not only the capital increase, I mean, we are doing divestments. We are, you know, partnering up, for example, as you have seen in the securitized product business. All of that generates a lot of capital and, and puts us through that transformation, as I said before. When does the new Credit Suisse become profitable? It will become profitable definitely from 2024 onwards. And, and this, and, there, and there's no chance. I mean, there's always execution risks. Where do you see the, the main execution risks today? Look, one of the one of the execution risks, obviously, is the market environment. The market environment isn't a very challenging one. It's not about blaming the markets. The markets is the same for everyone, and that's exactly how we deal with it. But you know, it's a challenging market environment, and we obviously, as you can assume. We figured that fully in in, in terms of how we did our plans. But so does it mean that you had a more aggressive strategy also to, to take account the, the market turmoil? I know there, there have also been outflows partly because of the markets. So did you have to overcompensate? No, it's not about overcompensating. The market is, is one of the factors which we figured in. I think how we did the planning for the next three years is we tried to do it in an, call it, prudent um, partially conservatively way to make sure that we, and that is very important for all what we are doing here, we do not want to over-promise uh, over and then under-deliver. We want to do it the other way around. 
Well, that was the Credit Suisse chief executive Ulrich Kerner speaking to us a bit earlier on. Now let's get straight to our Bloomberg finance reporter, Marianne Halftefmeyer, who's been really covering uh, Credit Suisse in detail uh, over the last, well, short of a decade almost. Marianne, thank you for joining us. When you look at the share price reaction, did they do too little? Did they do too much? Or is it just that we have to wear our, our way through for them to try and rebuild the bank? It's a good question, Francine. You know, last year when they announced a restructuring, it was very restructuring light. This time we're looking at ex restructuring extremes. So did they do too much? Had they not done as much, they may have seen the same reaction in share price. So I think investors and shareholders were really looking for strong, decisive actions. We've seen a lot of flow of information this morning on what they plan to do, from capital raise to things that they're selling to future capital investments. Um, so I think this is a this is a good, decisive plan that they have. Now it's about you know how are they going to actually execute that. Let's not forget it's a difficult market environment right now. And how do they rebuild, Marion? So we spoke to the chief executive. He says, look, he wants to be profitable by 2024. I mean, th this seems like a, a very short timeline. It's short, yes, because they do have a lot to do. Um, the rebuilding is going to have to incredibly focus on how do they get their clients convinced to stay with the bank. You know, they talk a lot about how early October they had a lot of client outflows. Clients were worried about the stability of the bank. That may have been, you know, spun around by, by rumors on social media, but there's a lot of questions surrounding, you know, will this bank actually serve my needs as a wealthy client, especially if the investment bank, we don't know exactly what this first Boston unit's going to look like, how much it's going to actually feed into the Credit Suisse business that remains. So a lot of question marks um, that they'll have to answer in the next two years. Marion, if you're, is there a space for a wealth management company, bank like Credit Suisse? And actually, again, going to your point, it's like, what's the value proposition? What is, is it in execution or is it really in the business model that the chief executive needs to convince people to stick around and, and get more people to join? There's definitely room for a big wealth manager like Credit Suisse. I mean, they've been a wealth manager for the last, you know, half decade alongside UBS, Julius Baer, Morgan Stanley. And let's not forget, they do have a strong presence in Asia and some of the emerging markets, including Middle East. So th that is definitely an interesting proposition. They still have the Swiss branding, um, so that will still be attractive to clients. And clients will want the option to diversify across different banks. So having Credit Suisse out there as a wealth manager is important. That being said, you know, how much they can do in terms of offering tangential services like IPOing a wealthy client's business, we'll, we'll have to see how that works out. I mean, obviously, Julius Baer has that model. They don't have their own investment bank, so they are often, you know, advising, helping clients out. UBS still has that in-house, so we'll see how they, how they play out. Yeah. Uh, Marin, what do we know about this possible, you know, investor into the first Boston spin-out? I mean, first of all, it's really a blast from the past that they call it CS First Boston, and who could come in and support that? Look, they've been talking to their existing investor base. They're talking to outside investors as well. Um, obviously, you saw that Michael Klein, the um, one of the board members, who's a former Citibank dealmaker, is going to be leaving the board and running that business. He has very strong ties to the Middle East, so we might see some Middle East sovereign wealth funds come in, um, who are also some of the shareholders of Credit Suisse, or we might see other parties that we, uh, we haven't seen named yet. It's to, to, to be determined. Um, those conversations will be happening. First step, they do actually still need to figure out how to separate that business into a separate legal entity first. Yeah, this is what we're hearing is really, you know, steps by steps by steps. And we just had the first one today. Marion, as always, thank you so much uh, for great insight, great reporting. Our finance reporter based in Zurich, Marion Haltefmeyer. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has accused China of trying to speed up its seizure of Taiwan. Blinken told Bloomberg China's undermining the decades-long status quo that has kept it from going to war over the island. Beijing said on Wednesday that China is closer than ever to realizing complete reunification of the motherland. What's changed is this. A decision by government in Beijing, that that status quo uh, was no longer uh, acceptable, that um, they wanted to speed up the process by which they would pursue reunification. Now, Iranian state media are blaming Sunni Muslim extremists for mosque attacks that killed at least 15 people in the southern city of Shiraz. 
The attack came as protesters marked 40 days since a woman's death in police custody, which has ignited some of the biggest anti-government protests in a decade. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francie. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, the ECB decides the governing council is due to reveal its rate decision in the coming hours. We're live in Frankfurt next. This is Bloomberg. Finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the ECB expected to deliver another supersized rate hike to combat runaway inflation as members of the Governing Council meet today. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo, who's in Frankfurt for us. So, Maria, what exactly are we expecting today? A rate hike and... Uh, yes, and that's a very good way to put it because Francine, when it comes to the rate hikes, is, is very well calibrated, very well guided by the governing council that we're expecting today, 75 basis points. Of course, that takes the deposit rate to 1.5 percent. There's a lot of perhaps suspense in terms of the signaling going into the December rate hike, but in terms of today, it is pretty much a done deal. This is 75 basis points. What's not a done deal, and this is really where every ECB watcher that I've spoken with uh, this week will be focused and paying attention to is the tilters. What to do with the cheap funding that is still doing the rounds in the euro system. Remember, Francine, to some extent, this is becoming a headache for the European Central Bank. Uh, they want to begin at least to talk about this idea of draining the excess liquidity from the system. But also, when you look at the arbitrage going into this, it could look like you're also providing essentially, well, a subsidy to banks at a point in which for a lot of Europeans, this is a cost of living crisis, politically not a Good look. There's some ways uh, to change it. We've talked about this reverse tier, the reserve uh, management, potentially just changing the terms uh, altogether. And of course, that implies litigation risk to some extent. But this is really the big unknown going into this. And I've been told in that press conference, potentially the issue that will dominate. Yeah, potentially, of course, the one thing that we need to watch out for. Great reporting, as always, our Maria today there on the ground in Frankfurt. So now we're joined by Stephen Bell, Chief Economist, EMEA at Columbia Threadneedle Investments. Stephen, what are you looking for, actually, in what Christine Lagarde will say today? Well, we want to know about the future. Uh, we do. We're, <laughs> we're going to hear about what they're going to do today. Uh, we'd like to know what her assessment is about the future inflation pressures, yep. uh, the future outlook for the economy. Uh, lots of people concerned about recession in Europe, yeah. these sky-high energy prices, even though they've come uh, Stephen, off a bit. On inflation, do, do you think actually we could have reached peak? So we have warmer weather, we're seeing demand for a lot of gasoline and gas pro products in Europe dwindling. Well, one of the points I make about European inflation is that more than half of it is food and energy. In the United States, most of it is domestic. So although wages have picked up, uh, rents have picked up, the fact is those domestic pressures are weaker. Yeah. So you could, given the outlook for weakening economy, argue that the inflation would come down of its own accord. So with the Eurozone weakening, do you think this is the last 75 basis point hike we get from ECB? Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I think what's interesting is how Christine Lagarde has, in a sense, led the way on these rate rises. They haven't been pushed into it by the market. And having seen the mistakes the Federal Reserve made, she said, you know, I'm avoiding an easing of monetary policy. That's how she introduced this concept at the beginning of the year. And actually, with the exception of the problems that Italy has faced, because, yep. you know, rates go up in, in, in Europe and they go up even more in Italy, bond yields, creating a, a potential risk to the fiscal side. Yep. Uh, that's still a big challenge. But for now, I think, the, as you say, the warm wind, as we certainly know here in London and most of Europe, is easing those gas prices, easing the risk of recession, but it's still there. Lots of industries, particularly in Europe, 
can no longer survive. Yes, and we don't know, and we also don't know, Stephen, where we'll be like December 5th or no. December 6th. Exactly. Right? We could see a huge downturn with, yeah. with like gale winds and we all need our heating up again. Give me a sense of what we, you know, we heard from Giorgia Meloni, the new um, president yeah. prime minister in Italy, and she was really pushing back against interest rates. We heard, uh, you know, similar comments actually from the French president as well. What should the ECB do about it? Ignore them. I mean, they are independent. They are about the most independent central bank in the world. It was constructed that way. Yeah. And, you know, uh, they don't have to count out to politicians. Uh, so unlike almost every other central bank, one way or another is under the control of the government. But this is independent. Yeah. And uh, the, the point about Giorgio Moroni is that she now has to take money from the European centre yes. because she doesn't have the fiscal space to cope with these very high gas prices. Northern Italy's cold place. It's not all warm uh, in Italy. So she can now benefit in the sense by borrowing at a lower rate from Brussels than she'd have to pay on the, on the bond market. So in a sense, there's an opportunity there for her to slightly ease her words because they're not grants she's getting but loans. So, yeah, she doesn't want higher rates, but, you know, that's not her yeah. call. And I think there's a list still of, of, like, 15 things that need to get done before they get the next well, round indeed. of money, which is in December. Uh, talking about QT, when are we expecting QT from the ECB? Yeah, that's another good question. I would say they'll be doing it uh, towards the end of next year. They'll be giving us a clear schedule for that. Yeah. And that will be obviously a big change, a big change. And you've got a list of things you said earlier that they were doing in terms of other areas of support. But now they're moving towards re regularizing monetary policy. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen Belder, Chief Economist, DMEA at Columbia Thread Needle Investments. Now we'll get to the really fun stuff, and that's talking about the UK because we've had quite a roller coaster on the UK economy in the last uh, six weeks. Coming up, a 35 billion pound black hole. That's an estimate of the gap the UK needs to plug in its tightened spending plan. So we'll discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the UK has delayed its revised fiscal statement until the middle of November. Bloomberg has learned that the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, needs to fill an estimated budget shortfall of £35 billion. A government spokesperson called that figure speculative. Now, here's what the Chancellor said about his priorities. Our number one priority is economic stability and restoring confidence that the United Kingdom is a country that pays its way. Well, still with us is Stephen Bell, Chief Economist at EMEA at Columbia Threadneedle Investment. Stephen, when you look at the UK, I mean, we've been through a remarkable six weeks. I know we kind of joke about it, but this is serious. It means mortgages have gone up. A lot of people are, are worse off because of, of the move in guilt. What happens to, you know, this administration? Where do they find the money to plug the hole? So the first thing is, he, things are going well for Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt because... Three days in. Three, well, yes. Three days but in. Jeremy Hunt, if you like, started it a few days Five days in. That. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, bond yields, guilt yields are falling. Yeah. So that's a virtual circle, less mm -hmm. borrowing. That's good news. And, of course, gas prices are lower, so the open-ended subsidy for household bills, that's yeah. lower. And there's lots of things that... Um, the fiscal rules are not exactly a straitjacket. No. You know, having well, the debt income ratio falling at the end of several years, that's, that's something that can be achieved. Inflation actually helps yeah. in the sense that that's the denominator. Yeah. So I, I don't think this is going to be quite the disastrous squeeze that has been built. And therefore, people will be relieved it's not as bad as they thought it would be. Okay, so you think investors will come back? I mean, I know there's, and we have a great chart actually looking at some of uh, guilt yields and what, what they've done over the last three months. There, there seemed to be a belief, because we've always had in this country the twin deficit and concerns about how you fund that. There seems to be a belief that actually it takes a lot more, so more pain, more austerity for international investors to really come back. Do you think that w with doing less, they'll still come back because people say we have less radical economic ideas? Yes. The, I mean, Kwasi Kwarteng was frightening to people. You know, he produced a reckless budget, had a bad reaction, said, I'm going to do more. You know, that really just isn't the way to do things. And it was much calmer now, and we're back to a sort of more steady ship. 
But I'm more worried, you mentioned twin deficits. I'm actually more worried about the current account deficit, yes. which is huge and it's yes. been persistent for decade after decade after decade. And we now have the situation where the interest on the interest is building up. Now, sterling's strong. Yeah. Sterling's gone up. There's been a big move out of the dollar. Sterling's benefited from that. But ultimately, if the economy does weaken, as I think it will, and we look at this vast sea of red ink on the current account, I think that will put sterling back down again. But ultimately, you don't need to have much of a bigger increase in gilt yields relative to other right. bond markets to start attracting money and to fund that, that deficit. What are you expecting from the Bank of England next Thursday? So now the market is pricing, what, a 100 basis point move. What do they do after that? Well, I'm not even sure they will do 100, but we'll okay. see. Why not? Well, I, I agree with you. If you need to get rates up, get them up. There's going to be such turmoil in the data following all that interregnum in the mortgage market where people thought they had a deal and they didn't, can't afford the new mortgage rates. Better to get rates up and then assess where things are going. Uh, but we just don't know how high rates have to be. The bank don't because we don't know how much downward pressure on other sources of inflation will come from the weakening of the economy that seems to be already underway. Housing market weakening. Europe's our big market, that's weakening. Yeah. So there's lots of things that are people's real wages are falling. So there's lots of things that to, if the Bank of England might think we don't need to do too much. All right, Stephen, thanks so much. Stephen Bell, their chief economist, the MA at Columbia Threadneedle Investments. For more on the UK, also be sure to Bloomberg to subscribe actually to our new podcast, In the City. It's hosted by me and Dave Merritt. We have a really fun one today looking at the Bank of England. This is Bloomberg. Radical restructuring. Credit Suisse shares tumble on plans to raise $4 billion of capital to fund a sweeping overhaul. We'll bring you more of our interview with the chief executive. Moment of truth. The ECB said to double its benchmark rate, the highest in over a decade, ramping up its fight against inflation. Plus, back to reality. Meta sinks 20% in extended trading and as sales disappoint, skyrocketing VR costs spook investors. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. A lot going on, so let's return to our top story this morning. And Credit Suisse has tumbled after announcing plans to raise $4 billion to fund a sweeping overhaul. Now, the bank also announced thousands of job cuts after reporting a fourth straight loss. I asked the company's chief executive, Ulrich Kerner, if this is the final reset. What is new Credit Suisse? You know, it's a much simpler, more stable, much more focused bank going forward, which will deliver uh, sustainably profitable results uh, to our shareholders. And what is very important, if I may add here, um, how, we, how we came here, so to say, right. we took a very hard look you know, at the needs of our clients and designed everything around the needs of our clients. So what was your overarching theme? How did you come up with this plan? What was your reasoning in getting here? Many different reasons. I, I, I think the, as I said, the bank is, is, is slightly too complicated today. The bank has parts which are not profitable enough, as we all know, from the shareholder perspective. And that's why we came up with, you know, the, the need of taking very decisive actions in mainly three different areas. The one is uh, radical restructuring of the investment bank. The second one is significant reducing costs going forward, as you have seen. And the third one, very importantly, further strengthening of our capital basis. Why is that? Because we want to go through the transformation of the next three years with a very, very strong capital base and leave the transformation also with a very strong capital base. So, so these are, you, are the three things. Are you, are you confident that the announcement today actually puts the capital question to bed? Yes. A hundred percent. What kind of uh, conversations have you had with shareholders? No, we have permanent conversations with shareholders. I think they fully understand, you know, our package, what we are doing in the area of capital, because not only the capital increase, I and mean, we are doing divestments. We are, you know, partnering up, for example, as you have seen in the securities product business. All of that generates a lot of capital and, and puts us through that transformation, as I said before. When does the new Credit Suisse become profitable? It will become profitable definitely from 2024 onwards. And, and, this, and, there, and there's no chance. I mean, there's always execution risks. Where do you see the main execution risks today? 
Look, one of the one of the execution is obviously is the market environment. The market environment is a very challenging one. It's not about blaming the markets. The markets is the same for everyone, and that's exactly how we deal with it. But you know, it's a challenging market environment, and we obviously, as you can assume, we figured that fully in in, ter in terms of how we did our plans. But so does it mean that you had a more aggressive strategy also to to take account the, the market turmoil? I know there there have also been outflows partly because of the markets. So did you have to overcompensate? No, it's not about overcompensating. The market is, is one of the factors which we figured in. I think how we did the planning for the next three years is we tried to do it in an, call it, prudent, um, partially conservatively way okay. to make sure that we, and that is very important for all what we are doing here, we do not want to over, uh, over promise and then under deliver. We want to do it the other way around. Talk to me a little bit about job losses. So I think it's it's 2,000 in the next two years, but then up to 9,000 up until 2030. Overall, going into 2025, as you have seen, we reduced costs by 2.5 billion yes. on a like-for-like -like basis. That comes with uh, like 9,000 job losses over that period, and with 2,700 as we speak now to get ready into the cost savings for 2023. So you also have an anchor investor, I don't know if I can call that, the, the Saudis, up to 10%. Have they asked for anything in exchange? No, look, what, 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 what they did with us is, you know, we obviously told them what we are doing, and they are obviously very much buying into our transformation. And in this sense, you know, that's, that's a strong and very, very welcome support for us. So you've spoken so far to, to your main shareholders, they're behind the reset? No, we are talking now to, to you know, all the existing shareholders, obviously, because we needed to get here. But for the, the MPP, obviously, we talked to a couple of interested parties. What's your main message to clients today? This new bank is built around you, around our clients. When you look at all the strategy options, was this kind of sitting somewhere in the middle? Was there something more that you could have done? No, look, as I said, the whole the whole new setup, so to say, came from, and that's what, what drove us through the last three months, actually, from the client needs. Because that's the most important thing for us in terms of how that new bank should work at the end of the day, number one. Number two, um, we took a very hard look, not only from the client perspective, but also from the look of all other stakeholders, i.e. investors, obviously. So that's very much designed. Yes you know, to be very profitable going forward. Um, but also our employees. I think there's a lot in for our employees. Mm -hmm. The new Credit Suisse, the Credit Suisse West Boston. And last but not least, also from the regulatory perspective, because we want to be a trustworthy and reliable partner for our, for our regulators as well. Well, that was the Credit Suisse Chief Executive Ulrich Kernel speaking there. Now, let's get the thoughts of Filippo Aluati, Head of Financials at Federated Hermes. Uh, Filippo, thank you, as always, for joining us. I mean, the share price is really pretty brutal with Credit Suisse today. Is this because of the capital raising? We knew that they didn't want capital raise. Is this just to, to basically stop all speculation about them needed to do more and they can rebuild now from the bottom? Yes, I think it is. Uh, it is. Uh, we knew that the restructuring was going to be uh, overarching and very broad. I mean, there's always people they say they could have done more, but uh, frankly, I mean, there were very few options left on the table. And also the share, I can understand the reaction because they raising 30% of the market cap. Uh, the, the, the terms will be disclosed on Monday, of course. But uh, at the same time, the share, I think they outperformed the banking index by um, 12%. Uh, um, in October, so I think it's, so it kind of makes sense that uh, this kind of result is better for credit than for equity. But then I concur yeah. with Ulrich in saying that uh, by 24, that's so will be, um, if the uh, strategy executed as they say, then that's so we'll be returning with a more stable, um, less risky credit suite uh, and very highly capitalized because they plan to have a 13.5% CT1 ratio by then. Yeah. But Filippo, so what's the main question now, right? If you look at how you rebuild, this is about execution. This is about making sure that actually he retains talent and that he can finally become profitable. So there are so many steps in getting to that end point. What do you want to know in the next six months, the next 12 months? Do we need a plan to see whether they follow through? 
Yeah, I think so. The next few months, as you said, will be very important. This is a long restructuring, so because it only ends essentially in 2025. And uh, um, I think so. There is a lot of steps uh, along the road. So first one, the uh, uh, spin-off for the investment bank, the new CSFB, also needs to be smooth. And I think also will be difficult. They have in very capital, uh, ca capable hands of Michael Klein, the former CT Investment Bank Supremo. Uh, they open in the capital. I think also we read in Bloomberg this morning there's 500 million commitment for invest external investor. And I think also in, when you uh, uh, downsize an investment bank, of course it's risky because you're dependent on market force. And sometimes it goes very well, like you did uh, with Deutsche. Barclays, when they did a smaller, much smaller investment bank reduction, and sometimes it go very wrong, like when um, uh, Heste was defenestrating RBS, because that's then RBS has a nine billion pound loss by the closing down of the investment bank. I think but, I saw, Chris, yes. No, Philippe, I, I mean, if you're an investor today in Credit Suisse, like what makes you stick around right now? How do we know that this is the, the last of the restructuring, that this time they make it, they get it right and move on? I, I think I saw, Somewhere inside Credit Suisse, there is a strong bank waiting to emerge. And I think that's what they rightly focusing on what they do best. That's so the wealth management. Let's not forget this is the second global wealth management franchise in the world. So it's worth something. And they do have the SUB, the Swiss unit, which actually is, is a gem. Actually, I rather prefer they go for fresh equity as opposed to selling the family silver, so to speak. So this is the reason why Credit Suisse, I think, is valuable. And that's, I mean, so the um, already the the stock market was ascribing a negative value to the investment bank. So now they're spinning this off. So I think also it will be more visible to external people that actually there is value in Credit Suisse. Um, Filippo, when you look at, you know, what First Boston, that spin out becomes under Michael Klein, there's talk about them drawing in investors to that. Do we have any speculation who that may be and what the, the underlying agreement on that? Or does it not really matter at this point? Um, no, I think it's so it matters that so someone is uh, stepping in, like, for example, the Saudis in the capital raise. I think so probably, yeah, we, we, all, uh, we always hear about the, the private equity groups. I think what it matters then there will be a, a full de risk and they will be able to deconsolidate all those RWAs and all these, these stuff. So I think so there will be a big contribution into um, capital relief and also staff reduction at Credit Suisse. And I think also the CSFB, the new first Boston, with relatively small. So we're talking about 45 billion of RWAs. Thank you so much. As always, uh, Filippo Aloati, their head of financials at Federated Ames. Now, coming up, has Mark Zuckerberg's big bet on the metaverse spooked investors? Meta's shares take a hit, pretty significant one, after the company reveals ballooning costs. More on that next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Mark Zuckerberg has moved to calm investors after Meta gave a weaker than expected revenue forecast for the fourth quarter. Shares plunged following the announcement, which also revealed increasing costs in the division devoted to Zuckerberg's metaverse project. I think we're going to resolve each of these things over different periods of time. And, you know, I appreciate the patience. And I think that those who are patient and invest with us will end up being rewarded. Well, for more on all of this, let's bring Matthew Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence. First of all, another very difficult earnings mm -hmm. a season for Meta. And good morning. Thank you so much mm -hmm. uh, for coming in. How should investors take this? Should they be worried about their future or will they address the concerns? Um, well, I, I think that they should be worried, and I think we've seen that in the share price reaction. I think, you know, we, we heard uh, Mark Zuckerberg there talk about kind of addressing these issues. I think you know, in the near term, they need to demonstrate that they can make money from this Reels product, which yeah. is currently cannibalizing their existing ad products and pressuring revenue. And then midterm, they've got this uh, monetizing their messaging platform, so Messenger and WhatsApp, uh, which is showing some traction but needs to get a lot bigger. And obviously, in the midterm, midterm long term you know actually making money from the metaverse if the metaverse right, even exists and you know, they're spending a huge amount of money um, on that bet right now but Matt this is a question right how do they monetize what they have I mean they have some great outlets how yep. do they make money off them 
Um, well, you know, they need to convince advertisers that uh, particularly things like wheels are, wor are worth uh, putting money against. They also need to convince content creators that they should shift from either just using Instagram or using TikTok to use things like yeah. Reels and they need to convince businesses that actually they're going to get a good return on investment in using things like the, um, the Messenger and WhatsApp products they're developing. The video of the week is Elon Musk mm -hmm. entering the Twitter headquarters <laughs> with a sink. Now yep. we've had this debate on whether is it a kitchen sink, is it a bathroom sink, why is he carrying a sink? Tell us about it, what we're expecting from Twitter and Elon Musk. Yeah, exactly. So he, he's kind there of... There he is. Yeah, there he is. He's turned up um, at Twitter HQ with the sync. He's going to be there um, for a while. I think, you know, tomorrow, Friday, is the day he's expected to complete the deal. So he's there really to kind of um, meet staff and, and share a vision uh, with them about what he's planning for the company. Obviously, a lot of people, they're concerned if they might lose their jobs, given all this um, news around potentially cutting up to 75% um, of staff there. So I think, you know, that's going to be a, a, a very in, intense crowd that he's kind of talking to yeah. tomorrow, assuming that the deal completes. Yeah, before then, though, we have Apple and Amazon mm -hmm. reporting a little bit later. I mean, I wonder whether the, this Twitter Elon Musk deal is like sucking up all of you know the energy of so many media analysts instead of <laughs> focusing on the numbers of these big companies. Yeah, maybe, although I think potentially Apple and Amazon might have a better story to tell okay. people uh, than what we've seen from Meta and, uh, and, and Google. I mean, it's, there's still going to be pressures there, but perhaps not quite as bad. I think uh, Apple obviously had the iPhone 14, so hopefully yep. they'll be demonstrating some good traction with that product. But China is a big pressure for them in terms of a slowdown. Uh, Amazon, you know, spread across so many different areas. I think obviously potentially some pressure on e-commerce, but they had uh, the prime day this quarter, which might help. Uh, and they're a challenger in the advertising market. So although we're seeing pressure on the advertising market uh, as a whole, uh, Amazon is gaining share, so they might have a more positive story to, to, to kind of tell in that space. And obviously they've got their big cloud business. Microsoft talked about slowing growth there, so people will be watching to see what's happening with Amazon Web Services. That's a big source of profit for Amazon. I mean, they should really do a big coup and, and come with a kitchen sink. Right Absolutely. for for earnings yeah. calls. Yeah. I mean, uh, fundamentally, <laughs> where are they, I mean, can, can they actually afford to increase prices when you look at some of the the Apple pressures and we saw them cutting actually, um, you know, what they're asking their suppliers to give them in this inflationary environment. Do they have any room to maneuver? Is it Amazon or Apple? Apple. Um, I mean, they have some. I mean, obviously, if you, you've seen it, the U.S. they kept the iPhone price flat, yeah. but in Europe it's gone up 15, yeah. 16 percent. Yeah. Uh, and I think the sense is that they have enough brand power to kind to of push those through. And Amazon did it. Amazon yep. increased their price for Prime. Um, exactly, and you've seen um, Apple put the pricing up on uh, their kind of streaming products. So yeah. I think you're generally seeing yeah. a shift upwards to yeah. reflect inflation, but also to compensate for cost pressure. Matt, thank you so much. As always, uh, with the very latest on media and tech, Matt Bloxham, Matthew Bloxham from Bloomberg Intelligence. Coming up, we'll look at some of the other earnings this morning and how markets have been reacting to those results. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. According to a new estimate, the UK government's decision to delay its economic statement by two and a half weeks could save as much as £15 billion. The Resolution Foundation says holding off on the budget event will allow official forecasters to include a sharp drop in UK bond rates since former Prime Minister Liz Truss was forced out of office. Now, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has accused China of trying to speed up its seizure of Taiwan. Blinken told Bloomberg China is undermining the decades-long status quo that has kept it from going to war over the island. Beijing said on Wednesday that China is closer than ever to realizing complete reunification of the motherland. What's changed is this. A decision by the government in Beijing that that status quo uh, was no longer uh, acceptable, that um, they wanted to speed up the process by which they would pursue reunification. 
Now, Singapore's central bank chief says Southeast Asian nations grappling with a strong dollar have been managing the situation well. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, Ravi Menon sounded an optimistic note about the global economy. Given where inflation is, a slowdown in the global economy uh, is not altogether a bad thing. It is a good way to relieve those inflationary pressures, provided the slowdown is mild, short and shallow. If that can lead off to some easing in labour market tightness uh, and slowing economy leading to inflation coming down over the course of the second half of next year, I think then the world economy is in a better place Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Earnings season well underway. We've looked at European banks reporting and recapped yesterday's U.S. tech giants. Let's also look at how some of the other equities have been performing this morning. For analysis, we're joined by Joe Easton from our equities team. So, Joe, thank you for joining us. There was Shell, I mean, there's so many reporting what's caught your eye so I think Lloyd's in the UK was an interesting one today so quite a shocking credit impairment from Lloyd's yep. around 600 million pounds much bigger than analysts expected Lloyd's more than the double. bank right not the insurance Lloyd's group. the bank this is yeah important <laughs> distinction there um, so and I mean if you look at their assumptions their macroeconomic assumptions they put in to me they don't even look that conservative so they're talking about inflation at around six percent next year GDP growth down around one percent so I think the bad debts could actually increase significantly. Some people would say it's prudent. I would say that perhaps that could get a lot worse. Um, they're obviously getting a big windfall with the rates going up. Bank of England next week, I think, probably most likely a 75 basis point hike. I don't think markets are probably pricing it correctly. I think 100 point basis points is probably jo getting overexcited. Am I, am I right to think they were one of the ones that were pulling mortgages, right? So when we had the, the guild mayhem. So they're the, probably the most exposed UK bank to mortgages. So that could be a real um, downside for them going forward, um, definitely for Lloyds. Yeah. Talk to me about Shell. Shell's doing very well, given where we are on energy security and increasing dividends. Right? That's right. So Shell returning around $19 billion of cash in buybacks alone um, in a year, in a full year, which is a huge amount of money. Um, and I think it becomes one of those situations where, yeah, we know they're making lots of profits. It becomes one of those situations where they get back in the eye of um, Sunak and the government in terms of windfall taxes, which they mostly avoided because most of the windfall tax covered uh, North Sea oil yep. firms. But I think Shell comes back in the firing line. Yep. And it was Sunak who announced the last windfall tax. So it's a point where the big profits become a risk for the company in my eyes. Yeah, I, I agree, actually, because it, it just goes back into focus and you kind of think, well, given what we're living through, um, what's our longer term strategy? You're also working on a great story about the outlook for pubs here in the UK. Exactly, probably my favourite sector, but the <laughs> pubs, um, so according to Deutsche what, Bank... What, to write on or to go and enjoy? <laughs> well, a bit of both. <laughs> um, so Deutsche Bank saying that the sector could face no um, earnings next year, so essentially break even yeah. next year, so no growth um, on the earnings. Um, and this is because the government reversed a cut to the low-end income tax oh. cut. They reversed that and they've also watered down the energy support, so that will... Um, end sooner, that will end early next year. This will reduce the amount of money that people have to spend in the pubs and Deutsche Bank saying that that could be um, very negative for the sector. Obviously, yeah. I'll do my best to support them personally, but um, we'll not a, not we'll a good one. We'll see you there on Friday at 1 p.m. just to do <laughs> exactly. our bit for the economy. Exactly. Joe Easton there from our equities team uh, for that market update. Now, this is a picture across the board. Credit Suisse under pressure. What I'm hearing is, look, they've done their best. Now we also need to see this play out because of that capital raising. Uh, the chairman saying that Credit Suisse will be a long-term investor in uh, First Boston spin-off. Credit Suisse will remain proud and an independent Swiss bank. We'll have plenty more on Credit Suisse, on the markets, and all earnings. This is Bloomberg. What is new Credit Suisse? You know, it's a much simpler, more stable, much more focused bank going forward. I do think we're facing a difficult period uh, in Europe. We are expecting the consumer in Europe to uh, feel the squeeze. Ultimately, the bear market will be over probably sometime in the first quarter. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines.
10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong are top stories today. Credit Suisse's stock slumps as it announces a $4 billion loss, a diluted capital raise and a complicated restructuring plan. We're going to have the latest from the ongoing strategy call in just a moment. Mark Zuckerberg pleading with investors to have patience as Meta delivers a disappointing revenue outlook. Shares are down circa 20% pre-market. And the ECB prepares to double up with an anticipated 75 basis point hike, taking its key rate, the deposit rate, to 1.5%. We'll be live in Frankfurt with the latest on that story. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London with Kayleigh Lines and Kriti Gupta in New York. Anna Edwards, Matt Miller both off today. Kaylee, interesting overnight session in Asia. Yeah, it was a mixed overnight session in Asia. You had stocks down in Japan and uh, China, but they were higher in Hong Kong, where all of that left us was for the MSCI Asia Pacific index higher on the day by just about half of 1%. So a bit of a mixed picture when it comes to equities. Of course, it has been far more consistent in the bond market after yields moved lower yesterday when it comes to U.S. Treasuries. Again, you saw follow through from that move in places like New Zealand, where the 10 year yield was actually down 19 basis points on the day to just under 433. But part of that had to do with a really strong auction. Then in foreign exchange, you have almost everything in Asia stronger against the U.S. dollar today. But the exception is the Chinese yuan, which, of course, had a remarkable day of strength against the dollar yesterday, but pivoting back to weakness on this Thursday morning, weaker by about three quarters of 1%. We're right back at that 724 level. Definitely a currency pair to keep an eye on. And the China story really largely is one to keep an eye on, especially for the commodity complex, because concerns around demand, specifically steel demand, have been weighing heavily on iron ore. Futures falling nearly 6% overnight at $81 a ton. We are now the lowest we have seen on iron ore going all the way back to May of 2020, Creed. Well, Kaylee, in line uh, with some of those risk rally moves that you saw in Asia, check out what's happening over in uh, the U.S. You actually have futures up at three tenths of one percent. What's interesting, though, is this follows some overnight earnings in, of Meta that weren't so great. This idea of tech really kind of having some sort of reckoning, um, really perhaps signifying some pain in the macro economy. Well, that isn't seeming to pull down futures by that extent. What I will say is perhaps what you're seeing this morning is some sort of technical reversal of what you saw yesterday. Kaylee, you just talked about simply this idea that there's a kind of uh, continuous Continuation of yesterday's trade in the Asia session today in the U.S. session, at least it kind of seems like early on a little bit of a reversal, not just in futures, but in the 10 year yield as well. 405 on the 10 year yield. Take a look at this yields up by almost six basis points yesterday. They were down by quite a significant amount. So I wonder how much of the volatility is really more technicals based rather than fundamentals based. Take a look at the dollar as well. Not a ton of movement, only stronger by one tenth of one percent, which might explain why in Brent crude, you're only trading around a 95 handle, not a ton of volatility there yet, guy. Yeah, Europe kind of starting to reverse a little bit, Kriti. Um, we've seen a few days of gains, a bit similar to what we've seen over in the United States. Um, you've got the London market outperforming. We're going to talk about Credit Suisse in just a moment. London's outperforming. Shell is doing well today. The numbers are a little bit kind of off where analysts may have been expecting, but the divvy increase is going to be so welcomed by people seeking income right now. Uh, it is a huge dividend. Obviously, the oil price, a huge factor in there. On the continent, broadly, we are lower. Certainly, Switzerland is under a little bit of pressure. Let's talk about what is happening, though, with some of the individual names uh, and the broader market. So, Stock 600 uh, trading 409. We're still north of 400. But Credit Suisse, look at this, down by 14.4%. Uh, we'll talk about the details in a moment. Shell is up by 2.86% uh, on the back of its update and going into the ECB we are still north of one we are still north of parity when it comes to the euro the ECB expected to deliver a 75 basis point hike today but what comes after that that's the real story that is going to be coming out of the press conference a little bit later what's happening with Teltros as well some big stories still to be determined uh, in the European session today but let's talk first about what is happening with Credit Suisse it is certainly the big story of the morning the stock tumbling this after the bank announced plans to raise four billion dollars to fund a sweeping and, to be honest, quite complicated overhaul. The bank also announcing that thousands of jobs will go after reporting its fourth straight loss. The company's CEO, Oricona, speaking, of course, to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix a little bit earlier today. What is new Credit Suisse? You know, it's a much simpler, more stable, much more focused bank going forward, which will deliver uh, sustainably profitable results uh, to our shareholders. 
Francine joins us now. Not the reaction they were probably no. hoping for. No, so it, the, we were always going to see some kind of reaction to the share price simply because uh, they're doing a capital raise worth yep. 4 billion Swiss francs. So that's huge. So we knew, but actually it's just been going down, down, down over the last hour and a half. And okay, the question is, is it because there's a lack of detail? Is it because they think we'll see more outflows? And at the end of the day, so they're spinning off this SPG, they're raising capital, they're bringing back Credit Suisse okay. first Boston. I mean, that's a, a blast from the past. The question is, how do they grow it so they're throwing the kitchen sink at it with this capital raising they're getting the Saudis to come in uh, to be an anchor investor and then they need to be profitable so it's unclear whether this will be a success whether investors will stick with them whether clients will leave and we don't have that many details yet yeah then the details we do have seem very very complicated Francine when you were speaking with the CEO what was his degree of confidence that this was going to work he was pretty confident, Kaylee. Uh, good morning. He uh, gave me a firm handshake as he came in. Remember, he's just been in the job for about two, three months. It was very clear that he says, look, we need to get through this. This was the right thing to do. It's what the markets wanted, at least on the capital raising issue, which many commentators uh, considered a step that they did not want to take. It should put that question to bed. Many more questions arise after this, but it was almost a, if they did too much, they'd get punished. If they did too little, it'd get punished. And so really, it's now in execution over the next six, uh, eight, 12 months on whether they can get it done. And the other thing is actually uh, we spoke to a lot of analysts and saying, look, some of them, maybe 50 percent of the analysts we spoke to believe there's a good bank in there somewhere. <laughs> so it's, it's whether this, this small bank emerges and whether it, it you know, creates value so that people want to give them their wealth instead of going to competitors such as UBS. Bloomberg's Francine Lockwell, we thank you as always for your reporting. Well, from one of the biggest movers in Europe to one of the biggest movers in the U.S., MetaShares falling this morning after the company's first quarter revenue forecast disappointed. The Facebook and Instagram owner also saw a second straight decline in quarterly revenue as it grapples with the decline in advertising budgets due to the slowing economy. CEO Mark Zuckerberg moved to calm investors after the results. I think we're going to resolve each of these things over different periods of time. And... You know, I appreciate the patience, and I think that those who are patient and invest with us will end up being rewarded. Alex Webb of Bloomberg Quick Take joins us now for more. Alex, thank you, as always, uh, for your time, for your insight this morning. But Meta, maybe three, four months ago, if you had seen these kind of numbers, perhaps would have tanked the entire market. There would have been a little bit more worry, a little bit more fear um, kind of baked in, into the price action. It doesn't quite seem like this is turning into a macro story. Your take. Well, we've certainly seen from a lot of the other ad tech companies, you include the social media companies like Snap, uh, amongst those, that the advertising market is very, very poor at the moment. And the thing you actually do when you look at Facebook and you look at the broader picture, it actually beat on revenue. So on that level, in terms of the, the money it's taking in, clearly it was doing better than expected. The disappointment was to do with how much money it's spending. And that's on a range of new, op new products, not least, of course, the metaverse, but also its efforts to compete with TikTok and, and some of the uh, incursions it's facing into its core business. Okay, so Alex, I look at the reception that we're seeing in trading this morning down 20% after some pretty brutal losses for Alphabet and Microsoft after their results yesterday. It makes me very nervous for Apple and Amazon when they report after the bell. Do we have a sense on if things could be as bad for them? Well, there is a little bit more optimism around Apple and Amazon than perhaps some of those other companies. Amazon had particularly disappointing prior quarters, which means that they have also made comments about coming in and bringing in some, some cost savings. There had been a massive expansion of their warehousing um, capabilities during the lockdowns. They sort of over-expanded and now are correcting that. Apple, expectations not massively high. We've seen reporting already from Mark Gurman and, and uh, Debbie Wu, our colleagues on the tech team, about how many devices they are making. It is the expectation is the number of devices is level with the year earlier. So anything which is a moderate surprise in that direction will be taken quite well by the market. Apple has managed to build tremendous resilience by gluing people to its devices through its rapidly expanding services business. All right, Alex Webb of Bloomberg Quick Take, thank you so much. Apple right now down about six tenths of a percent in pre market trading ahead of its report. Now, there is one other tech company we're watching this morning, and that would be Twitter. 
Elon Musk made his present felt at the company's headquarters yesterday, posting a video of himself walking into the offices carrying a kitchen sink. He tweeted, entering Twitter headquarters, let that sink in. Very funny. While he was there, Musk told Twitter employees he does not plan to cut 75% of the staff. Bloomberg has learned that he denied the number in an address to workers at the San Francisco office. However, the billionaire is still expected to cut staff when he takes over the company. That $44 billion deal is set to close on Friday, and the market seems to believe it will happen with shares trading just shy of that 54.20 offer price in the pre-market guide. Wonder what happened to the sink, Kelly? Um, <laughs> No idea. I suspect it will be used. Uh, let's talk about uh, what is happening in Frankfurt today. The ECB is expected to deliver another supersized rate hike uh, to combat the runaway inflation we're seeing in the Eurozone. Members of the Governing Council meeting today in Frankfurt. The rate hike looks baked in. Maria today, our European correspondent, joins us now from Frankfurt. Maria, 75 looks like a done deal, but there's all kinds of other details we should be expecting today. Teltro's potentially uh, what's going to happen going forwards uh, in terms of the QT process. Just kind of walk us through what we will and won't get when we get that announcement and the press conference later. Yeah, let's get to it because, uh, Guy, when you look at the rate path, uh, today it is pretty clear, very well calibrated, very well guided uh, to the market from the governing council suggesting that this is going to be a 75 basis point hike. Of course, that takes the uh, deposit rate to 1.5%. Percent. The question would be sticking to the rates of uh, do we get any signals in terms of the December meeting? Remember, we're expecting yet another rate hike, but that seems or it seems the field at that point will be more broad. Remember, Madame Lagarde has said this is a central bank that is on a journey and will handle things meeting to meeting. Now, the focus point, of course, there's no suspense when it comes to the rate hike, but there is a lot when it comes to the Teltros. This is, of course, a cheap funding that is doing the round still in the euro system. It is becoming a headache for the European Central Bank. On the one hand, we know they want to kickstart uh, this conversation about draining some of the excess liquidity from the system. And then secondly, in the arbitrage, when you look at the bigger rate picture, it could look like you're subsidizing banks essentially in a cost of living crisis for a lot of Europeans. So politically, the optics are not good on that. Now, there's a number of ways in which they could change the Teltras. There has been talk about a reverse tier, perhaps also the management of reserves, potentially just changing the terms, although that could lead to legal uh, problems for the central bank. But what we hear today is that this is the focus point in this press conference. That will be the focus. The rate hike is very well priced in. The question is, what happens to those Teltros going into this meeting? We will look forward to the coverage as we work our way towards that meeting, that announcement a little bit later on. Maria, thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Maria today outside the ECB in Frankfurt. Stay with Bloomberg for extensive coverage of that ECB decision and that news conference from President Christine Lagarde. It all starts at 8 a.m. New York time, 1 p.m. here in London. Coming up, Pooja Kumra, TD Security Senior European Rate Strategist on that ECB meeting. And the American middle class is facing its biggest hit to its wealth in a generation. Read more of today's big take story on Bloomberg.com and also on the Bloomberg terminal. Before to, uh, be sure to uh, check out the debut of our new Big Take podcast as well. Uh, look for that on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts and on the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomer Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Katie Gupta with Kaylee Lyons in New York. Guy Johnson joins me in London. Anna Edwards and Matt Miller throwing a party somewhere that we weren't invited to. Check out this chart, though. <laughs> I really want to talk about, of course, the Federal Reserve, but this idea here that there's more perhaps panic built into the market than there is actually showing. Take a look at this. This is a chart that shows North American investment grade CDSs. Uh, for a radio audience, stick with me. We're also showing European investment grade CDSs as well. Basically, on a five year time span, you can see this massive spike in 2020, which tells you when the line goes up things are not looking good and you can kind of see that you can see that kind of uh, aggressive pivot in 2022 the idea that the fed is now going to be much more hawkish will the credit market panic but you actually haven't really seen that in practice in fact some of the new issuance volume seems pretty healthy and the market is actually able to digest that so is this really a question of market plumbing at the end of the day and if the markets are functioning is that really a bad thing let's ask our global credit reporter lisa lee who i've just learned is now living in london and 
very <laughs> jealous. Lisa, uh, join me here, give us your insight. If we don't see an issue in market plumbing, do we really have an issue at all? Well, I think some of the headline numbers can be a little misleading because the market is very bifurcated right now between haves and haves not. If you're a company that's well rated and highly regarded, then the market reception is decent. But if you are highly levered or looking for acquisition financing, it's becoming really difficult. And it has been difficult, and that's where you see some of the distress and the high CDS numbers and the worry about what, how these companies will weather inflation and higher rates. Junk has re-rated significantly, yet people are yet to pounce. When does the pouncing happen? I think the problem is that there's just been so many repricings, that there have just been so many different periods where they thought, okay, this we've, we've repriced, but then they've repriced again and again. And I think, especially in the fall, there was a sense that there might be a period of calm, but Citrus came and it performed worse than people expected. And, you know, you had, we had CS's earning today and yep. part of their losses is Citrix. Citrix accounted for some of their, not, I mean, yeah. not a great sum, but a some portion of it because they accounted for a great number in 2Q, but 3Q turned out worse than possible. But right now, you're starting to finally see some green shoots in the high yield bond and leveraged loan markets. The sense that maybe finally the repricing is over and there's some calm and the worst is behind them. Why? Why do we see those green? So what is it that, that, that is making people start to think that the situation is beginning to resolve itself, that we're not going to get more repricings. What, what, what signs are you looking for? Well, I think, for one, if you look at the new issue markets, the banks are starting to like start to test the waters again for acquisition financing. So yeah. there's one deal called Tenneco, led by Citibank. It's an Apollo Global LBO. And they're thinking of trying to like test the waters again and see investors' appetite. Because, for one, the high yield bond market has shrunk to the record level. They've never seen such shrinkage. Net supply is down. So perhaps there's people with cash on the sideline that's willing to do it. But mostly it's really about, it's been about the inflation and rate hikes. And the idea that maybe investors finally have a handle on how much the Fed and the ECB will hike rates. And so there will be no more repricings. In that case, they can see what they should be paid for to take on risky debt. Is default risk really as low as the market seems to believe that it is, though, Lisa? I think that's the big question. 3Q is when people expect to see um, inflation really hit earnings. And we, don't, we haven't gone through 3Q earnings yet. And what companies will be able to pass through inflation and protect their margins and which ones won't be. We really haven't seen that. Investors don't even know themselves. We have never had such high inflation in this sort of, in this modern high yield bond market and leveraged loan market. So I think that's what they're also waiting to see, how this 3Q earnings pan, pans out. But it's a real question because if we get worse earnings, which we which already we're starting to see, I think um, default expect expectations will, will change. We're very happy to see you living here in London. <laughs> it is wonderful here in London. It is. Lisa, thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Lisa Lee. Um, OK, for more on what's happening with the markets uh, and the analysis that we provide, go to your Bloomberg terminal. MLIV Go is the function that you need. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Kriti Gupta in New York and Guy Johnson in London. Anna Edwards and Matt Miller are off today. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. President Xi Jinping says China is willing to work with the U.S. to find ways to get along. Those comments came before a possible meeting with President Biden at a Group of 20 summit next month. They signal an effort on Xi's part to maintain ties despite disputes over everything from Taiwan to chips to the invasion of Ukraine. On that note, Russia has carried out military exercises simulating a retaliatory nuclear strike. Vladimir Putin oversaw the drills. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told Bloomberg that the U.S. has warned Russia any use of a nuclear weapon in the war against Ukraine would have grave consequences. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has been forced to scale back a plan to impose a cap on Russian oil prices. That follows skepticism by investors and growing risk in financial markets. Instead of strangling the Kremlin's oil revenues by imposing a strict lid on prices, the U.S. and EU are likely to settle for a more loosely policed cap at a higher price than once envisioned. 
And Tesla is facing a U.S. criminal investigation into its self-driving system. Bloomberg has learned that the Justice Department is investigating whether the company made misleading claims about Tesla cars' ability to drive themselves. Neither the government nor Tesla are commenting. And Creedy, of course, this is not the first issue Tesla has run into with the autopilot program. There's going to be a trial in the new year regarding a death uh, while that program was activated. And on the self-driving note, you also have Ford writing down at stake in another autonomous driving startup because they say it's just too far away for that technology to really realize its potential. You know, it sounds so innovative, but at the end of the day, it really is a core part of their businesses. I mean, uh, Elon Musk back in June said at solving that technology could be the difference between Tesla being worth a lot of money and being worth zero guy. Yep. Look at what happened with Mobileye yesterday. Mm. Intel listing that business, that IPO absolutely flew out of the uh, out of the, uh, the the market yesterday. Really big gain. Uh, fantastic to see that happening. IPOs are back. Yeah, well, coming up, we will get more to the broader macro picture. Pooja Kumra of TD Securities will be joining us to talk the ECB. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and here's what you need to know. Credit Suisse's stock is slumping. This is announces a $4 billion loss, a dilutive capital raise, and a complicated restructuring plan. Part of our interview with the company's CEO ahead. Mark Zuckerberg pleading with investors to have patience as Meta delivers a disappointing revenue outlook. Shares are down, let's call it circa 20% pre-market. And the ECB prepares to double up with an anticipated 75 basis point hike taking its key rate to 1.5%. I'm Guy Johnson in London, Kaylee Lines and Kriti Gupta in New York. Kriti, what's happening pre-market? A little bit of green on the screen when you look at futures here, but I wouldn't call it a ton of buying conviction when you look at today's market. In fact, it's only up by a really marginal amount of about two-tenths of 1%. Take a look at the 10-year yield, though, 406, because as you start to see stocks higher, you actually see bonds pulling out a little bit, selling off just a touch, about six basis points for, uh, higher for the 10-year yield. What's interesting, though, is that the, this uh, kind of era of both stocks and bonds being bid uh, at the same time, well, today that's not necessarily the case, but, but keep an eye on it because uh, directionally they've been been moving uh, in, in the same direction. Nevertheless, with those yields higher, the Bloomberg uh, dollar index up about two tenths of one percent. So once again, not a massive marginal move, perhaps a little bit of a wait and see for what Christine Lagarde says later today. And of course, Brent crude still trading with about a 95 handle, Kaylee. All right, Creedy. Well, I've got a massive move for you, and that is Meta in pre-market trading. This is just wild to me. This is a stock that is now down about 20 percent this morning in early hours. But back at the start of the year, this was almost a $1 trillion company. And if these losses in free market trading hold, it's only going to be worth about $283 billion. So we're talking a company that went from being the sixth largest in the U.S., now down to number 20. Of course, part of that has to do with the advertising headwinds it is facing. We've heard that from other companies as well. But the other part is that this company is planning to spend big on things like the metaverse and virtual reality. Investors don't seem to like that, even though Mark Zuckerberg has asked them to be patient. If there is some companies, though, that a big spending on technology for Meta is good for, it would be some of those chip makers like NVIDIA. It is actually gaining after Meta's results. It's up about 3%. Not as great of a story for another company in the semi space, though. Wolf Speed uh, gave earnings and a forecast that both missed expectations, so it is getting punished brutally as a result, down about 24% in pre market trading. And then finally, have to mention Twitter as well, because the saga maybe is finally almost over. Elon Musk planning to close that $44 billion deal tomorrow. He was at Twitter's headquarters yesterday saying he's not going to lay off 75% of the workforce. And the market seems to be betting on the fact that that deal will indeed go through because this is the closest we've been to that 54.20 offer price. It's trading at 53.92 in pre-market guy. Talking of kitchen sinks, Kaylee, let's talk oh, yes. about what is happening with Credit Suisse right now. The stock is being absolutely hammered. Uh, we're trading just north of four. We got down towards four. Uh, we're lifting off the lows of the session right now. We're trading at 416. We're down by 12.5%. This is a very complicated restructuring. There is a dilutive uh, capital raise that is going to take place. There's no room for error here. And profitability still feels like it's a long way off. So Credit Suisse is down. Broadly, European equities uh, are down by around half of 1%. The energy sector is having a relatively good day, though. Look at what's happening with Shell. We're trading 27.46. Big increase in the dividend and the buyback. That's going to be really welcomed by those seeking income right now. Euro dollar down a little bit. The dollar's just beginning to reassert its strength a little bit. We're down by around half of 1% as we head in 
to the ECB, Kaylee. Well, on that note, Guy, obviously the market is expecting the ECB to hike 75 basis points once again. My question is, after what we saw with the Bank of Canada yesterday, is there a risk that they don't do that and only go 50? Joining us now is Pooja Kumarat, TD Security Senior European Rate Strategist, who will help us answer that question and more. Pooja, do you think the move will be 75 today? And if it is, how much further can the ECB realistically go, given that the economy is weakening? Good morning to you. Uh, so unlike a BOC, we are not expecting any pivots from ECB just yet. Uh, just to give you an idea, including today's 75 basis points rate hike, their deposit rate is just at 1.5. So this is still below their expected neutral, which is 2 to 2.25 percent, which tells you that ECB is still not in their restricted territory. And given the fact that we have inflation prints much higher than what they had expected in September, they will have to hike rates. And the only thing is now, not only ECB, but all central banks need to sound less hawkish. The entire move with respect to verbal tightening has been done, and that's been visible when we see bond rates, which are much above 2%. So there, it will be rather a cautious hike, but they are still not done, and we are not ready for pivots from the ECB just yet. So you think we go to 50 next time? Do you think it's 75? Is it, is it 75 today, 50, then 25? That sounds like a perfect plan, but ECB always gives us some <laughs> hawkish shocks. Uh, so I think with respect to ECB, they do have two intention prints, as I mentioned. One is on Monday itself, and the other one comes in November before the December meeting. And they, they are going to be higher than what they're expecting. So there is a possibility that they may have to go with 75 in December. But we are thinking more towards 50 just because if December liquidity as well as pivot from Fed is likely to suggest that even ECB does 50, but I would expect their hiking cycle to actually last longer than Fed in 2023. The ECB dished out a lot of money to the banking sector in the form of Teltro's. Uh, as rates go higher, that becomes expensive. How do they solve that problem, and are we going to get that news today? Yes, I think that is one of the key policy areas that markets are waiting for them. So they do want to tap bank profits. And that will happen via either changing the loan terms for TLTROs. But the only thing with this uh, is that they could have legal battles from Germany as well, which we already heard in the news that German banks are not particularly happy with them changing the terms. Otherwise, they could also look at reverse tiering. If you recall, SNB did actually implement reverse tiering, i.e. they are basically tapping the kind of deposits that banks get. One of them is pretty much likely because clearly ECB right now is taking losses on the QE portfolio that they hold, and also they are giving banks a lot of profit. So I think some way or the other, they need to actually address these TLTRO loans. Pooja, I'm old enough to remember when 120 on the euro was a really key <laughs> level and, and freaked everybody out uh, when, it, when it dropped below, including, I should mention, officials at the ECB. Now we're looking at euro dollars that are literally just sitting at parity here. How worried should the ECB be about the euro? I think they, this is one thing that they have not been able to fight since the start of the year. And I think they have realized that they, unless we see a big pivot from Fed, Euro dollar will, not, will be hovering around parity. And this is not just Euro dollar, the same story for yen. And I think now the focus is whether BOJ will be able to do anything to defend their currency. So I think with respect to ECB per se, they have to close their eyes towards the uh, dollar right now. And I think what they are hoping for is that at least the natural gas prices actually move in their favor and that could tame down at least inflation for them. Well, Pooja, I'm glad you mentioned that because I wonder how much of the movements that you're seeing, not just in the currency market, but in the bond market as well, is perhaps less a result of the ECB and more a result of the commodity pricing. Uh, I think right now, whatever moves that we are seeing with respect to bond market is basically a bit of a cautious move ahead of the ECB, just given the fact that we did rally almost 20, 30 basis points this week per se. And I, I, I think, yes, commodity prices is a risk for markets, but I think today's move is more of a cautious trading ahead of the meeting. Well, and I wonder what details around this meeting we will get when it comes to QT, Pooja. What is your expectation? How realistically do, early do you think they can start? So I think realistically, uh, the UK market turmoil has shaken all central banks. So at this stage, they do not want to talk about QT, just given the fact that that would take bonds even close to 3% if they start talking about their balance sheet. Uh, I think when it comes to 
how they want to take policy right now. They have said their rape tool is the primary tool, and that's why they are keeping PEP reinvestments as well as TPI open, which can address any financial fragmentation. And I think once they have got some hang over inflation, i.e., they are closer to their terminal, which is 2 to 2.5%. Two to that's only then they will start addressing QT. And that's where I think that's more like a t second half of 2023 story. But needless to say, this is one question that will be asked in the press conference. This is a question that will get addressed somewhere this year, even in their statement. And it's going to be very difficult for BTP versus Bund spreads to trade around the current levels if the ECB does provide us more insight. Certainly something I think all eyes will be on. Pooja Kumara of TD Securities, we thank you as always uh, for joining the program this morning. Coming up, Credit Suisse has announced plans to raise $4 billion to fund a sweeping overhaul. We hear from the CEO next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London, Kayleigh Lyons, Kuri Gupta in New York. Anna Edwards, Matt Miller are both off. I don't believe they're at a party, as maybe <laughs> Kuri was suggesting a little bit earlier on. Um, let's talk a little bit about Credit Suisse, because that certainly is the story uh, that everybody is focusing on here, guys, over in Europe. Uh, unveiling a strategic plan involving a capital raise of 4 billion Swiss francs. It is potentially carving out its investment bank, thousands of job cuts are likely to go as a result. Our good friends and colleagues over at Reuters are suggesting now that Credit Suisse is mulling an IPO for the CS First Boston business. A blast in the past, as somebody put it a little bit earlier on. CEO Ulrich Kona speaking to Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix a little bit earlier today. What is new Credit Suisse? You know, it's a much simpler, more stable, much more focused bank going forward, which will deliver uh, sustainably profitable results uh, to our shareholders. And what is very important, if I may add here, um, how, we, how we came here, so to say, right. we took a very hard look you know, at the needs of our clients and designed everything around the needs of our clients. So what was your overarching theme? How did you come up with this plan? What was your reasoning in getting here? Many different reasons. I, I, I think, the, as I said, the bank is, is, is slightly too complicated today. The bank has parts which are not profitable enough, as we all know from the shareholder perspective. And that's why we came up with, you know, the, the need of taking very decisive actions mm -hmm. in mainly three different areas. The one is uh, radical restructuring of the investment bank. The second one is significant reducing costs going forward, as you have seen. And the third one, very importantly, further strengthening of our capital basis. Why is that? Because we want to go through the transformation of the next three years with a very, very strong capital base and leave the transformation also with a very strong capital base. So, so these are, you, are the three things. Are you, are you confident that the announcement today actually puts a capital question to bed? Yes. A hundred percent. What kind of uh, conversations have you had with shareholders? No, we have permanent conversations with shareholders. I think they fully understand, you know, our package, what we are doing in the area of capital, because not only the capital increase, I mean, we are doing divestments. We are, you know, partnering up, for example, as you have seen in the securitized product business. All of that generates a lot of capital and, and puts us through that transformation, as I said before. When does the new Credit Suisse become profitable? It will become profitable definitely from 2024 onwards. And, and, this, and, there, and there's no chance. I mean, there's always execution risks. Where do you see the main execution risks today? Look, one of the one of the execution is obviously is the market environment. The market environment isn't a very challenging one. It's not about blaming the markets. The markets is the same for everyone. And that's exactly how we deal with it. But you know, it's a challenging market environment and we obviously, as you can assume, we figured that fully in in, ter in terms of how we did our plans. But so does it mean that you had a more aggressive strategy also to, to take account the, the market turmoil? I know there there have also been outflows partly because of the markets. So did you have to overcompensate? No, it's not about overcompensating. The market is, is one of the factors which we figured in. 
I think how we did the planning for the next three years is we tried to do it in an, call it, prudent, um, partially conservatively way to make sure that we, and that is very important for all what we are doing here, we do not want to over, uh, over promise and then under deliver. We want to do it the other way around. Talk to me a little bit about job losses. So I think it's it's 2,000 in the next two years, but then up to 9,000 until 2030. Overall, going into 2025, as you have seen, we reduced costs by 2.5 billion yes. on a like-for-like -like basis. That comes with uh, like 9,000 job losses over that period, and with 2,700 as we speak now to get ready into the cost savings for 2023. So you also have a, an anchor investor, I don't know if I can call that, the, the Saudis, up to 10%. Have they asked for anything in exchange? No, look, what, 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 what they did with us is, you know, we obviously told them what we are doing and they are obviously very much buying into our transformation. And in this sense, you know, that's, that's a strong and very, very welcome support for us. So you've spoken so far to, to your main shareholders, that they're behind the reset? No, we are talking now to, to you know, all the existing shareholders, obviously, because we needed to get here. But for the, the MPP, obviously, we talked to a couple of interested parties. What's your main message to clients today? This new bank is built around you, around our clients. When you look at all the strategy options, was this kind of sitting somewhere in the middle? Was there something more that you could have done? No, look, as I said, the whole, the whole new setup, so to say, came from, and that's what, what drove us through the last three months, actually, from the client needs. Because that's the most important thing for us in terms of how that new bank should work at the end of the day, number one. Number two, um, we took a very hard look, not only from the client perspective, but also from the look of all other stakeholders, i.e. investors, obviously. So that's very much designed, yes. you know, to be very profitable going forward. Um, but also our employees, I think there's a lot in for our employees. Mm -hmm. The new Credit Suisse, the Credit Suisse West Boston. And last but not least, also from the regulatory perspective, because we want to be a trustworthy and reliable partner for our, for our regulators as well. CS's CEO speaking to Francine Lacroix a little bit earlier on. The stock is down 11.23% right now. Off the lows, still down pretty hard. Um, the ECB is the other main event we're watching here in Europe a little later on. Former ECB chief economist Peter Pratt uh, is going to be joining us. That's at 11 a.m. New York time, 4 p.m. here in London. Uh, Alex Steele and myself will be talking to Peter a little bit later on to get his analysis of the ECB meeting. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Kriti Gupta in New York and Guy Johnson in London. Anna Edwards and Matt Miller are off today. Now let's take a look at what they're missing and what is ahead on this Thursday. Tech earnings will continue with Apple, Amazon and Intel reporting. How will those go after a series of disappointing reports from mega cap companies over the last few days? Then in monetary policy, it is the ECB decision at 8.15 a.m. New York time. And then about 15 minutes later, we'll get some U.S. data, including GDP at 8.30 30 a.m. Eastern. While the consensus calls for a 2.4 percent expansion in GDP this quarter, some economists are lowering their estimates after data showed a jump in imports last month. To help us break down the numbers and what they will mean for the Federal Reserve, Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, is joining us now up early for us on the New York set. So, Mike, the number looks like it'll be fairly good on the surface. What about when you look under the hood? Well, that's going to be the real question. The headline number is going to be very good compared to what we had the first half of the year. First two quarters of the year, we saw some contraction. Now analysts think we're going to have a 2.4 percent uh, expansion for the third quarter, an annual rate. But it could be even higher than that. The Atlanta Fed's GDP now indicator was 3.1 percent yesterday. So there's also the possibility of an upside surprise. But you look at the next two numbers there, personal consumption, Americans maybe 
spending a little bit less during the third quarter. And business investment will get the September number. That'll be part of the overall GDP figure. And that is supposed to be down just a little bit as well. So it may not be as good a news as it looks on the surface. What you want to look for is the breakdown of the GDP and how it comes through uh, consumer and business spending trends, as I mentioned, spending on goods versus services. We've been waiting for that shift. Is it happening? Now, the question is, inventories and exports, did we get a big jump in inventories that boosted GDP? Uh, did we get a big fall in exports that subtracted from GDP? Those are things that people are going to see. We also want to see what's happening with residential investment because, of course, the housing market has Rates sort of a little high. jumped off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, and government spending. Uh, the federal government isn't spending as much these days, but state and local governments have a lot, so are they making up any of the difference? Well, you, you referred to kind of the manufacturing sector a, a little bit, but I'm curious about simply the sustainability of the strength of the manufacturing sector. sector. We get some data out today, durable goods, uh, capital goods as well. What can we expect there? Well, it looks like they slowed in the third quarter, but the orders uh, are going to have an impact down the road. So if they come in stronger than expected, it fits the narrative that the economy is still performing well. And that's kind of the whole story with the headline numbers out today. The Fed has been raising rates a lot and the economy doesn't seem to be slowing demand a whole lot yet. And so that keeps the inflation question on the table. Mike, I definitely get the sense you're, you're not that excited about the GDP data. Are you excited about the ECB? Yeah, I mean, the ECB is kind of the, the story these days. We know what the Fed wants to do, but the ECB has a lot of decisions to make. Uh, the kind of decided they're going to do 75 basis points. The market's priced that in, in terms of the uh, deposit rate and the main refinance rate. But uh, the question of what they do with Teltros is interesting because that's those are the loans that they made to banks at a very low rate so that they could pass those loans on to consumers. Now the problem is with the deposit rate positive, the banks will be making a lot of money at a time when Europeans are going to be stuck in a cost of living crisis. So the question is, what do they do about that? The, they're suggesting that they're going to do reverse tiering, in other words, exempt some of those deposits that uh, are at the ECB from the uh, deposit rate. They won't get as much money. It won't be a subsidy uh, to banks. So that's going to be kind of the question. And then we'll want to find out from Christine Lagarde when they're going to start reducing their balance sheet. That was a big question for the Fed. It's been a big question for the Bank of England. Now it's the ECB's turn to tell us something about that. Why we key. Thank you very much indeed. Mike's excited about all of this. We know he is. <laughs> uh, we're looking forward to the ECB. We're looking forward to GDP. I appreciate that the Fed may be on rails at this point. Um, I, you've got a lot going on today. I, I'm really interested to see kind of where Meta closes today, guys. I think that's going to be absolutely fascinating. You've also got a lot of tech being rolled in as well today. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what Apple is going to be doing as well. It's not all macro today. No, it's not. There's definitely micro, but at, to some extent, these big tech companies are also macro in that there's such heavyweights within this market that the direction they go, it's very hard for the broader market to go any other direction. And with the kind of punishments we are seeing for Mrs. Meta, Alphabet, Microsoft, it'll be really interesting to see what kind of reception Apple and Amazon get after the bell guy. Absolutely. They'll be talking about all of this next. We're done with early edition for surveillance, but surveillance is up ahead. Tom, John, Lisa, Jeremy Stretch joining us to talk FX. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>